you get disconnected from the field sometimes in your construction business. And you know that's happening when profit starts to fade, customer issues come up, perhaps there's conflicts between the field and the office that are unresolved. And one of your key jobs as a construction company owner is to stay connected as much as you can. Now, obviously, you're not going to wa walk every single job site that you're on if you're running a multi-million dollar construction company. But there is times to get out into the field. There are times to sit face to face with your customers. And that is what we talk about today in this episode of Construction Genius. My guest is Ben Yunker. He is the co-founder and CEO of Craftsman's Choice, which is a leading exterior remodeling contractor in Minnesota. We talk about the symptoms of disconnection, how you get into the habit of staying in connection with the field, and specific action items that you need to take on a regular basis in order to bridge the gap between the office and the field and between the field and your clients, how to overcome issues in the field that seem insurmountable when you're on a project, and why it's so important as a construction company owner once in a while to get your bags on and go out and work with your guys. Now, I know some of you, that'll never happen because you're working as commercial contractors and you're, you're not gonna put your bags on, but the point is, getting into the field, getting belly to belly with the guys and the gals who are actually doing the work can be tremendously helpful in terms of giving you the right perspectives on where your business is. And those are the kinds of things that we dive into detail about during this conversation. So like I always say, enjoy my conversation with Ben. Feel free to share it with other people who you think may benefit from it. And thank you for listening to Construction Genius. This is Eric Anderton, and you're listening to Construction Genius, a leadership masterclass. Thomas Edison said that genius is 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration. If you're a construction leader, you know all about the perspiration, and this show is all about the 1% inspiration that you can add to your hard work to help you to improve your leadership. Ben, welcome to Construction Genius. Thank you. I'm very interested because you've, you've grown a, a successful business. And one of the challenges that you've overcome as you've grown your business is when you got to the point when you began to add people into the company and you, and you got disconnected from the field. Can you tell us how that happened? Well, at that point in our business, uh, I just bought out my business partner. And so there were some necessary things that I need to some new roles that I needed, needed to take on as far as some of the sales and marketing that my business partner had, had managed some of those, some of those areas. And so I tasked uh, a, my general manager with, with taking care of production. And so he would um, oversee all production, uh, our project managers and our, our service team. And some of the things that I thought we had pretty locked down were not we're, we're actually gaps in our, in our process. And so I needed to make sure that, you know, we were getting into those areas that we could, we could focus on. And our general manager helped us to, to get that back on my plate and say, Hey, you're off base here. Like the things that you're working on aren't things that we need help with. Here's what we actually need help with. Interesting because, um, as, as you take a, a bigger picture, look at, at different construction companies that you're familiar with, and even your own uh, company, you're, you're describing one reason why you know someone in your position would get disconnected from the field. What are some other reasons that that construction company CEOs and presidents get disconnected from the field, and kind of as a result of that, the, the company suffers? Well, I think things that I've seen um, maybe a lack of interest on the production side and get heavily so focused on sales and marketing. And this and this is something that's incited by manufacturers and vendor reps, you know, it's mm -hmm. all sell, 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 sell. Right. Oh yeah. We got to get somebody to install this stuff once we get it sold and somebody right. to manage those installers. Right. Right. So that's, a, it's interesting, right? Because on the one hand you have to be able to be bringing in work, but if you're not executing that work profitably, then what's the point? Exactly. Yep. Um, so what are, what are some of the symptoms of, of disconnection that, you saw for yourself, but that you see in other businesses where you know there's something going on here. The executive team needs to get 
more dialed in with what's going on in the field? I think one of the biggest symptoms is you start to lose people, you know, project manager burnout because they're doing menial tasks that maybe uh, they don't need to, you need to add staff, you need to help them be better uh, at their, at their trade and keep them focused on the right tasks. I think unsatisfied customers, the quality drops where it used to be something that, you know, you took your pride, you took pride in, whether that's correct oversight or it's, not vetting installers, not in vetting the, the people that are doing the work, your quality is, is suffering because you're, you're missing something in that, whether it's a punch list process, whether it's not having the correct manager in there, those, those things manifest themselves, I think, in quality and, and losing people. That's interesting. So, so you, you talked about the burnout of your project managers, the quality of, of what you're building, and then the satisfaction of the customers. Those are the three things that I just heard in what you said there. Yep. Um, so let, let's talk about the burnout a little bit. You use the, the phrase menial tasks. How is it that those menial tasks cause burnout with project managers? So the, the things that we see in our business are maybe material shortages on the, on, the, on the job site. And that, to me, part of our process needs to be preparing those projects ahead of time. So when we turn it over to the project manager, he's got the things that he needs. He's ready right. to, he's ready to go. And so if he's spending time running materials or he gets a call from, you know, the guys on the site that at four 30, that they need this to finish the job, he doesn't get home till seven. That's, right. that's, that's not a fun day. And so, right. you know, putting those jobs together involving the project manager so that he's involved and can have, you know, foresight into that project so that, you know, he's not making those 7.30 runs and, and missing dinner. So, so what, do you, what do you do to make sure that that's not happening? How do you avoid that? So what we implemented was we used to do a, a project walkthrough with our, with our customers about a month out from, from the job. We're, uh -huh. we're currently at about, you know, three months out. Now we've pushed that forward to two weeks after the contract signing. So some of those things that a project manager would see can be addressed earlier in the process. And he can get those things on the material list. And it's, it's helped, helped quite a bit uh, just to be more prepared because sales and production are going to look at that project totally different. So when the salesman puts his pack packet together and the things that he thinks is going to be needed there is much different than, you know, the, the production side, how they look at a job site. Let's talk about that. Why is it that sales and production look at a job completely differently? Uh, the salesmen are they're trying to get the check. And so, you know, when they, when they go out there, their focus is, at least in our business, design, addressing the customer's needs. And if you have salesmen that haven't been in the business, they haven't you know, had the tool belt on, they're not going to necessarily know some of those things. And to be honest, you know, I'm okay with that. You know, that it's two separate, two separate jobs, two separate silos that they're working in there. And so as long as the measurements and some of the other things that the sales guy, when he turns that job over and the, and the scope is set, you know, it's the production teams to take that project scope and execute that. And so when they look at it, it's just that different perspective of, you know, what is it going to take to take what the, the salesman has promised and make this happen on the job site? And whether that's, you know, some extra time with the customer drilling down on a specific part of the project that, you know, the design is great, but there's some problems with the implementation and the, and the, um, the execution of that, that just needs to be drilled down a little bit further. Okay. So let's, let's just explore that a little bit more because how do you balance the need to make the sale with the, with the ability to actually execute the project according to what has been sold? Well, one thing that, uh, we do is, is, pay our salesmen on gross profit. And I think okay. that helps them to ask a few more questions. Like, is this even possible? Uh, you know, I know there's other contractors that will just do it a straight, you know, straight percentage of, uh, of the contract. Right. I think you can get into trouble doing that way. Cause they just, you know, they're in and out and you know, whatever happens on the back end and the headaches the production team has, isn't their concern. They're on to the next one. And so that helps to ask a few more questions on the sales side, maybe call in the production manager or the project manager to say, Hey, what do you think about this? You know, am I charging the right thing for this? You know, is this right. even possible? 
Right. So there has to be that communication then between the sales team and the production team to make sure that 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 what is being sold can be built. Correct. But yeah. like you said, though, you're you're comfortable with a little bit of with creating the need for maybe some ingenuity on the part of the production team based on what's been sold. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Okay. I mean, they they're the they're the nuts and bolts guys. They're the ones that, you know, need to make that happen. And, you know, I, I think that's a part of the project that they like too. like taking siding off and putting it back on. I mean, that can get boring doing, but yeah. if you're, you know, building the portico and you're having to, you know, figure out a barrel vault, you know, that perks their interest that, that they're construction guys at heart. They want to, you know, they want to be creative and, and imaginative and, and, and ultimately have something and that they can deliver to the customer that uh, they can take pride in. Awesome. So let's talk a little bit about the, the quality what are some of the reasons that quality suffers on the jobs that you um, you guys execute? Oversight of the project manager because he doesn't have the time to be out there with the crew and walk the job and notice those things while the project's going on because he's delivering a dryer vent to another job that should have been on the original order. So, right, right. you know, it's kind of a, a cycle where, you know, once you fall behind, you know, your, your quality drops because you're chasing things for a different job that should have been already out there. And so that's, yeah. that's where we found ourselves as we've scaled up a little bit mm -hmm. is, you know, we need to plug those gaps and, and, you know, it's on us and the, the executive team to figure out where those gaps are and how we can improve upon that. Okay. So let's talk about that. Um, as, as you were looking at the gaps, what did you do to begin to address those? So it, we've implemented some uh, some additional technology as far as there's a, a photo a collection uh, software uh, company cam that you know allows everybody to, to see inside that job and that mm -hmm. integrates with our CRM so you know everyone from the from the office manager to all of our uh, service team once a picture is taken they're able to see that. And so what that's allowed to happen is we make, we have the sales guy do those and they're able to take an unlimited amount of photos to put in the job file that helps those guys prepare uh, ahead of time to see, you know, if that's a four inch vent or a six inch vent or, you know, whatever that little thing is that they're going to, that they're going to need there. Okay. So, so you, you've used technology, different kinds of software packages and, and put them together in order to help to improve quality. Am I hearing that right? Yep quality and and preparation ahead of time so that right. yeah, you know yeah. there it, it you know those i think those two things i want my guys my project managers focused on you know being in front of the customer and being with the crew not running materials okay so um what technologies have you tried in your business that haven't worked you know we were slow to adapt to technology cuz i just you know the the co some of the cost for some of these CRMs are so high that I just, you know, we stumbled along until we found the right one. And for me, it was, you know, the ones we looked at fit 10% of my business or 20% of my business. You know, they were great at sales or they're great at marketing. They were great at production, but there wasn't one that, you know, that did all of it that, that I felt like. And so the one we landed on has customizable workflows has customizable files that you can upload it has an interaction with the customers where they have their own portal you know a, a number of different things that just just fit our business okay so then how did you resist the um the software sales guys coming in with their easy button promising you the world you know you, you took a step back and said hold on a second this is not quite meeting our needs how did you resist all of that how did you go through that process i just asked them you know, the pointed questions on, you know, what, so is this customizable? How right. do my, how do my customers interact with me through your software? How does it integrate with our accounting software? And if, if it couldn't do each one of those things, then I, I just, I said, it's not going to be a fit. And were you heading, were you heading up that, that, um, you know, that's that evaluation of the software programs, you, were you heading that up? Yes. You were yep. okay. Yeah. Uh, the the reason I'm asking is sometimes because you know, especially in like larger contractors, you know, these software sales guys come in with this easy button and they say, "Hey, just press this and everything will go fine." But 
you know, people haven't taken the time to define the problem that they're looking to solve. They haven't taken the time to ask, will this really work in my business? And it sounds like you did some good work around that in order to bring in a package that not only could meet your needs, but then could be customized to fill in the gaps where it didn't out of the box, so to speak, meet the specific things that you wanted. Right. And that's a lot of homework. I mean, that's, right. it, it, it's a lot of work we had, you know, we thankfully that January that we started looking into a software, we had three weeks here in Minnesota that were 20 below. And so all the guys were in the office, we had whiteboards everywhere. And we said, mm -hmm. what do we want to happen on every job? And so we had everybody from our newest hire on the service team to our general manager, sales guys, you know, what are the things that need to happen? And, you know, we've tweaked that quite a bit over the, over the years sure. and added things, but it was a great exercise for our entire team to say, well, that's common sense. I said, well, yeah, yeah, it, it is common sense, but in, unless we have a way to track that that task has been completed, it could get forgotten. You know, it could like posting the permit on the door, you right. know, like, of course it's common sense, but until you have something that says, Hey, post the permit and you click that, there's no way to follow up on the back end, you know, to see that that's actually been done. Yeah, no, that's really good. When you brought in people from the field, what did you, what insights did they bring um, in those discussions that you hadn't thought about? A lot of it was around uh, sales um, and the things, you know, our, to our earlier discussion about sales promising things that, you know, when they got out on the job site changed. You know, yeah, yeah. that, that, you know, there's, you know, where you want us to build a, a deck here. Well, you know, the soil's horrible. Like we right. have to do these, we have to do these special helix coils here, you know, and, and, and it was a great, it, it was more productive for the sales side than it probably was for the production side, other than they weren't going to get these job packets and, and say, Oh my gosh, what did they sell? What are we doing here? You know, right. the sales side is able to, to, to glean that information. And so the next time they go in, that they're able to, to ask that customer those questions and say, hey, we might want to have this checked out before we get too much further. That's interesting. So going through the process of, of figuring out why what you, you needed the software to solve, you were able to build some bridges internally between those natural silos between sales and production then. Yeah. And, and, and you know, that to me, again, that's when, um, you know, it went from a partnership to me being the sole owner. You know, we started doing uh, trips every other other year. So I, every other year, I'd take the guys to Mexico, and the whole team goes and their right. spouses. And so, you know, it that really helps to build that camaraderie, and you know, have the guys all hanging to hanging out together. So they 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 don't feel like they can't pick up the phone and say, "Dude, what'd you sell?" Like, come on, like, right. what are we right. doing here? You know, they it's not you know, there's not that those 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 natural barriers that sometimes an installer wouldn't wouldn't make that call. No, I understand. That's, that's cool. Um, just, uh, I'm, I'm curious, you, you started your business, you know, many years ago as a partnership and then transitioned out of that. Um, why did you transition out of a partnership into a sole ownership? Uh, it was, it was mainly driven uh, by my, my former business partner. He had been doing in construction and doing this his entire adult life. And he just got kind of a wild hair. So he, uh, he uh, went out to Montana and lived out there for uh, a few years and, you know, ran a, a spray foam business for a little bit and then ultimately ended up coming back to Minnesota. And now he's, uh, he's one of my sales guys. So he's still, he's, he's back in the business. That's interesting. Yeah. That's interesting. What do you see as the main difference? What do, in your experience between being in a partnership and being the sole owner? For me, I think it, uh, it really allowed me to, to grow into some of the areas that maybe I wasn't uh, as strong in, you know, the sales and marketing side, that was kind of what Matt, Matt was able to, to, to take care of, but having to be able, being able to make that decision and that's your decision. I think you put more research into it rather than mm -hmm. if you have somebody else to bounce it off of and, and kind of go back and forth, you're going to look at it a little bit, a little bit more. Cause it's, it's you, right? Like you, you, you're, you're, you're the one that the, the buck stops with. So, you know, you need to make sure that the decision you're making, you know, we have a hundred individuals whose lives depend on me making good decisions. So I feel it's my, my duty as a, uh, as a leader to take the time to, to, to do the research that's needed for some of this big stuff. 
Do you have a process in place that you use for decision making? How do you go about making those, uh, you know, those big decisions, like you said, that are, that could affect, you know, hundreds of lives? So I kind of look at, uh, you know, what other businesses in our, our field have done. Mm -hmm. um, I'll check with, you know, some of the, the national manufacturers, things yeah. that, you know, that they've, they've seen. And really, I think I've learned the most in my business from watching other companies make mistakes and, and yeah. mistakes that we've made. And so, you know, try to look at what didn't work, which sometimes is, is like the blueprint. Like people think it's the blueprint, but when you really dig in, it really hasn't been that successful, but everybody keeps following that same, uh, that same pattern. Can you give um, me an example of something like that? So I feel, you know, the one call close, the, the, the hammer on people, what, what you get with that is you need to have a ton of marketing to feed that because you're probably not going to get a lot of referral business. And, and a lot of the major remodeling companies, um, you know, some of the big boys, that's, that's the thing. They have TV ads, they have, you know, uh, all the big marketing things because they always need fresh new customers because there's not a lot of referrals because get at the kitchen table and it's the one call close, get people to sign up and then we'll find somebody to, to install it. So the quality is not, not great. And so right. we've taken the opposite approach, start with the installation and, and really incentivize our customers to get referrals and, and do a quality, a quality job. That's interesting. So that that's one of the wonderful things about being in business is that you can choose how you want to do the business. Yeah. And you can okay. question, you know, the conventional wisdom and, and decide to try other things and, and see what works for you. Yeah. And, and in some of those cases, what, what good is a high margin if all of it is going to advertising and marketing, right. you know, and, and, you know, I, high margins are great, but if, you know, you're spending it on things that, you know, are just cycling in, cycling around it, I, I just, I didn't see the value there. So. Right. That's interesting. Um, which do you prefer? Do you prefer being in a partnership or being a sole owner? Uh, being a sole owner. Yeah. 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 So if you had to do it all over again, knowing what you know now, you, you would just start as a sole ownership? You know, there were so many valuable lessons and things yeah. that Matt and I went through together, you know, which shares that we share, we'll always share a bond together. You know, we, we started, uh, our first work truck was a 1969 F100. We called, it the dream, we called it the dream weaver. It had the three on the tree. You know, there were many days coming home from the job site and 95 degrees that, you know, we were stuck to the seats in that thing, you know, and just the perseverance learned, like, like we just knew this was going to succeed and, and nothing was going to stop us. And so I think it would be a little, a little tougher to do by yourself without that constant giddy up back and forth, um, you know, to the point where I'm at now, obviously things have, have changed and, and I'd prefer that, but those early days, uh, of our business were, I mean, they, they're, I look back very fondly on them. So interesting because that's what, what, you know, the, one of the challenges, you know, when I'm talking with construction company owners who are in partnerships is that a partnership is challenging. It's like having a second mm -hmm. marriage, Yep. but just what you described there is so interesting because if you hadn't had the partnership to begin with, then perhaps you wouldn't have uh, gotten to the point that you are at now with the success of your experience because you had that support along the way there. Yep. Interesting. So let's talk about customer service a little bit. You know, the principles of customer service are universal across all industries and across all, you know, construction types. T tell me a little bit about how you have evolved your customer service process over the years to lock in those relationships and then to get referrals, which are so critical to every business? I think it's a, it's an evolving metric. I, I think, you know, customers expect more now. They, they go into the process better informed than they did when we first started our, our business. When we first started, we were educating the homeowners on almost every aspect of the project. Now, you know, when we show up, they've got a list of questions, you know, things that they've, uh, they've researched ahead of time. And so we need to make sure that we're prepared with product knowledge, with, um, you know, past projects, and then we share our, our process with our customers, you know, and I think that's important. That's not something that a lot of people don't do is, you know, 
you can't ask someone to write you this giant check and then not tell them what's going to happen after they hand you the check. They, they, they need to know what this is going to look like. And so that helps set expectations on the front end of how this is going to look, how it, how it should look. And guess what? It, a punch list is part of it. it it's going to happen. You know, these guys aren't robots. There's going to be some things. It's a natural part. Here's how we handle the punch list process here. Here's how those things are addressed. So, you know, if you see something that doesn't look right, don't freak out. It, it's part of the natural process. And so setting those expectations help and then getting on those, those punch lists on the back end. That, that's, that's huge. How do you balance this? I like that idea of, 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 of being transparent. How do you balance the need for transparency or, or that, that philosophy of transparency where you're open with your, your customers with the fact that, you know, sometimes in construction, um, you know, the sausage is getting made and I'm not sure I want to show you exactly how the sausage is getting made. Not that I want to, you know, hose you or anything like that, but yep. you know, there's a time to be transparent, so to speak. And there's a time not to be, is that correct? Or how do you look at that? Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Like, you know, th those little adjustments that the project managers will make with the guys on site, you know, those little corrections, you know, we don't run in, into the customer's house and say, Hey, uh, you know, Ivan screwed up this piece. We need to rip it off and, 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 and replace it. We just do it, you know? And right. so some of those things we try to, we try to head off right when it's happening the transparency piece comes in steps like, you know, if there's multiple trades involved, here's, you know, what's going to happen. Here's what this process is rather than just, you know, a trailer full of windows showing up and guys barging in your house, you know, like we're going to be in your business when we're doing your windows. Like, like right. we need space. We need, you know, it, again, one of those things that seems common sense and the guys are like, well, why wouldn't they know that? Well, they've never been through a window project, you know, right. they, 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 sure it's common sense to us but you know yeah you've got to move your dresser away from your window so that we can get back there but unless yeah. somebody tells them that uh, you know that's it's not on their radar yeah it's interesting because we we we're like uh you know we're we're fishing in a, in a bowl of water and and we're so familiar with the water and then you know you plunge someone else in there who's never been in water before and they start right. freaking out so you gotta let yeah. them know what the, the experience is going to be like yeah especially when you got you know a bunch of people ripping your house apart you're you're a little on edge yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, so, so let's say a, a customer issue comes up. How do you handle? Let's say it's a major issue. Like you guys have screwed up something. Um, it, it happens. It's construction. What do you do? What's the first thing you do when when a major issue comes across your desk? I will pull the project manager off of that project. Not do, and even if it's not something that he has done we've got our general manager and we've got a production manager. Part of that is selfish because I don't want him churning on something that, you know, is not productive. And so we, we swap out either the, our production manager or our general manager and they're, they put on their cape. They're the Superman. They come in to save the day. And sometimes, sometimes that fresh face and that attention, like this is important to us. Here's my card. I'm the general manager that's enough to calm the situation so that they can finish the, the project out. How do you, you know you're at the point where you need to flip out the project manager? Because, you know, you, you, ideally the project manager would be able to handle the issue, right? Yep. When it, when we see that the project manager is, is working with this client and sometimes it's client, most often it's client issues. Sometimes it's project manager issues. Right. Um, when we see that the, the, the nothing's getting moving forward. Like, you know, things are getting escalated, the, the customers getting more uh, irritated with the process. Again, that, that fresh face really can calm a lot of things. And just that, again, that card with the title general manager, I'm right. here to, I'm, I'm here, your job's important. Your stuff, your, your, your problem is important. We're going to take care of it. And that usually happens near the end of the project anyway. Um, most of the things, you know, that, and a lot of times it's just, they're sick of people being at their house. And so right. little things can escalate and, you know, that, that new face helps to, to calm those, uh, those worries. Yeah. It's interesting. It, it, it doesn't even necessarily have to be a massive issue when it comes to being in someone's home. It can be a simple thing yeah. or a little thing that just triggers someone, huh? Leaving the gate open and the dog gets out. Oh, uh, we've had that. 
had that happen where, <laughs> oh, you know, <laughs> that's not a good one. How could they uh, do that? How could they do that? I know. Right. I know. So um, going back to this idea of disconnection from the field, um, how, how do you stay in the habit of being connected with the field? What's, what processes do you have in place that, that help you to, uh, you know, stay in there, so to speak? Well, I try to get out with, with my guys once a quarter, my, my service team once a quarter, tool belt on. Usually I pick a nice sunny day, not a, a rainy day. That's uh, right. But <laughs> out, you know, my phone stays in the truck and we just go out and, and, and work together. Um, it's one of my favorite things to do. You know, I, I started as an installer, but it bra- builds great camaraderie and it also you know, gets me on the job site, looking at the product, looking at interactions with the customer, you know, cause I'm, I'm not the, the, the owner that day. I don't walk over to the customer and say, Hey, I'm the owner. You know, it's just, I'm just the installer guy that day. And so, you know, kind of incognito undercover, undercover boss. boss. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That and then, but the, but the guys in the field know who you are, right? They sure do. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. That's cool though. That's cool. It's yeah. like it's like when you're playing sports, right? And the ringer comes into you know you you bring the ringer on. You know you you got the guy. It's like uh, my kids are playing baseball right now, and they were complaining. Um, one of my kids was he plays JV, and they were complaining that in, in a tournament this one school brought down some of their varsity players to play JV so that they could win the tournament. You know what I mean? Right. Yep. <laughs> except for the, the, that analogy works, except for my installation skills aren't as good as my guys. Yeah, so, right, right, you know, right. I, but still I'm usually, having you on the side helps, huh? Yeah. I'm usually the guy that's holding the other end of the tape or, you know, oh, that's that cool. kind of thing, but it's still, um, <laughs> they don't let me touch a cock gun. They will not let me touch a cock gun because they don't want to redo it, but it's still just, it's, it's a good time to, to be out with the guys. And yeah, that- another thing we do is we do it. We do a company golf tournament where we bring in uh, all our vendors. We bring in, um, you know, suppliers, service team, all our subcontractors, everybody's there and they're all paired with each other. So, you know, you could have a, you know, regional, regional manager of James Hardy yeah, that's with our roofer. And it's just right. a great thing to get, to get them together, get them. And, and the installers, they, they really like that. That's terrific. So, um, so you, going out into the field helps to stay in contact with the field. What, what do you, um, what do you learn when you're out there that helps you to run a better company? I think as a business leader, empathy is one of the greatest tasks, one of the greatest traits that you can have. And so, you know, when you're looking at a project and you're asking these guys, why is this taking so long? It, it's right. what, what is going on? And you, and you start to, you know, question the guys who are out doing the job and then you get out there and you say, okay, well, you know, it looks like our task today was just to put siding on this wall, but the electrical box is pulled out. So we got to take an extra 15 minutes, an extra half an hour. It, it helps for me to gain that perspective that it's remodeling. Things aren't just going to work in lockstep. And I need to make sure that I put myself in their shoes and that, you know, as long as they're trying and, and moving forward, we're, we gotta, we gotta be on the same team together. And I, I need to look for ways to make their job easier, not for them to make my job easier. Tell me what you mean by empathy. Seeing something from somebody else's situation. So, so, yeah. so putting yourself in their place and being able to, to see a, a certain outcome or something from their you know, from their path to it. And so how do you balance the need for empathy with the need for excellence? Well, I think it, it starts with your selection of your people. Hmm. Um, you know, I think if you uh, surround yourself with people that honesty and, and hard work, it's a little cliche, but it's, it's unique, especially in the construction industry. It seems, it, it seems like, the other things will, will work themselves out. And, and, you know, if you put them in a position to win, put good people in a position to win and, and set some, some ways for them to excel and give them the tools to excel, it works out most of the time. How do you, how long does it take you to figure out whether someone is honest and hardworking? Sometimes a couple of years. Interesting, um, huh? Yeah. It's uh, I mean, I've had people work for me that 
was just looking forward to so much them joining the team and got them in. And six months later, it was just, you know, they just, they weren't who they, you know, they, who, who I thought they were. And the other, the other thing has happened too. like, well, all right, let's give them a shot. And they just excel and just, and just kill it. So, you know, maybe that's a reflection on me as far as character, but I think, you know, individuals are so different and, you know, individuals in different stages of their life are so different. You know, you need to catch somebody at the right uh, point in their life where they, they, they care and they want to want to succeed and, and put them in that right spot. What have you learned about hiring that helps you to av- be a little more tuned into whether or not someone is going to be one of those, you know, six month wonders where they show up for a bit and then their mass drops and, and you really see who they are? I think how much they talk about themselves is a, a fairly good uh, indicator how they talk about their previous employment or their previous wins. Do they talk about, you know, they were part of a team that did this, or I did this, you know, how do they jump around a lot? You know, are there, you know, when you jump around a lot, it can mean either it can be performance-based or it can be, you're looking for something that you may not be able to, uh, to find at these different things. But, you know, if it's, if they're at different jobs every year, that's usually a pretty good indicator that they're probably going to be at my, my job for a year. Um, Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. And what is it about someone where you're hiring them? What, what have you learned? Why is it that you're thinking, you know, man, this guy is really going to be awesome. And then six months later, you're like, dude, why do I even hire them? What what is it that causes you to think that? And then, you know, to have to reevaluate later, you know, early in our, in our career, we, you know, Matt and I, we ran everything. And so, you know, we, we had to know each piece of the business and each step you're looking to take something as a business owner, you're lo- looking to take something off your plate, right? That's why you hire, hire people. You don't want, you don't feel like that's a good use of, of your time. Yep. And one particular instance, it, it, somebody had this, this background, you know, running a, running a successful business, had some hard times as a, boy, perfect fit. Like this should be child's play to him. And whatever reason it was, if it was just not dedicated enough or didn't really like the position, it just, it just didn't turn out. And that's interesting because you said something earlier that caught my attention um, that, that plays into hiring, but we don't really think about it a lot. And that, uh, or we, we know it's true, but we don't necessarily think about it. And that is the point of life that a person is in Yeah, when you hire them. Well, you know, I, I look at my life, I look at the lives of my employees and, you know, when, when you're young, you're better able to just go out to the job site and just work all day, 10, 12 hours, just pound, pound, pound. But as you have a family, you know, other things, you know, other, there's other resources of, that your time takes and if matching that point of, in that person's life with, uh, a, a job responsibility, I think is important for a leader to recognize. I can't hire this guy with three kids that are all in sports and expect him to be at the job site 12 hours a day, uh, swinging a hammer. That That's an unrealistic expectation. He could probably do it, but we want our, our guys to have that proper work-life balance and to be able to enjoy their work and not have, you know, their wife on their, on their case, cause they're getting home late every, uh, every night. And we believe in redemption at our company. Uh, You know, I've got a lot of guys that have uh, some interesting pasts and I will take a guy who's overcome some of those hardships and doesn't ever want to go back than a guy who's had everything handed to him uh, his entire life every time, because they, they have that background that you know, I've been down that road. I'm going to do everything in my power to, to move forward, to not ever get there again. So how do you handle that? Because, you know, I, I know plenty of people like that and some people make it, some people don't. So you meet someone and they're, you know, they're really, you know, they appear to be on the path, so to speak. Yep. And then for whatever reason, you know, they, they fall off of it. So how do you handle, you know, working with folks like that who perhaps are, you know, their struggles are a little more obvious than other people Yeah. in terms of knowing when to, to support and when to cut the support, so to speak. One thing that we're able to do 
and kind of maybe oversee that process. So if somebody's a year out from some really bad life choices, right? Uh, they're at a point where they are, are are looking to make a change. We will, you know, put them in contact with one of our subcontractors and start off as as a labor laborer or you know have that and kind of see gauge. Okay, what are those? How are they they dealing with that? Because I think humility has got to be a big part of that that path to um, to success. And, you know, if you say, well, I'm not going to pick up shingles, then, you know, maybe you're not, you're not serious about, uh, about coming to work for us. And so that gauges, that gets us an ability to kind of have oversight and see, okay, is this really going to happen? You know, are they going to work hard? Are they going to work their way up on that crew? And then, you know, see if they're, that, that change is if they're able to keep the change and, and make things move forward. Do you have a relationship with your subs where they're willing to take on some guys like that for you just to, to test them out, so to speak? Yeah, absolutely. Our, our subcontractors, uh, you know, we view them as part of the three-legged stool, you know, the company, the, the customers and our subcontractors They're they're, you know, I've got subs that have worked for me for 20 years, you know, they are, um, uh, as loyal as it gets. And, you know, we help them work on their business. I think that's one thing that a lot of contractors, you know, they don't help their subcontractors work on the business side. That's the part they're not that great at, right? Like taxes. There's a reason they're subs, huh? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Taxes, <laughs> like, you know, a retirement program, you know, I'll, I'll you know, insurance. We've yep. got, we've got a, a thing on our insurance or on our, our CRM that we can't assign a subcontractor unless his insurance is current and that helps them to be able to keep that stuff up and you know being able to work with them on the business side of things just a little bit it's not a huge it's not a huge thing uh time thing but it helps it helps to build that long-term relationship and then you use the word redemption what do you what do you mean by that word redemption someone who's who's been had hard times had uh made poor choices that have got him into uh, situations that, whether that's, you know, jail or substances and are, are starting to work their, their way back. I think, uh, sometimes we, uh, are afraid to take that on. And, and in some cases, you know, big corporations, they, they just won't, you know, right. whether it's insurance reasons or, or different things, you know, I'm in an opportunity, I'm in a, a place where, you know, I can, take a little more chances on, on some of the guys and, and my business doesn't um, suffer from that. But those, uh, again, stories of redemption where somebody's had a hard thing, they've been in a bad spot and they've worked their way out of that. The lessons learned by that individual through that process are character building and somebody who I want uh, as a part of my organization. Do you have an example of anyone who's been in your business for a while and they're in a leadership role who, you know, when they first started was, uh, you know, someone who, you know, like just gotten out of jail or been dealing with drug issues and stuff like that? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I, and, you know, I, I don't, he wouldn't mind me sharing this because he's pretty proud of, uh, of, of his path, but, you know, grew up in Minneapolis, was actually, you know, a, a drug dealer for a time. His, his daughter, his, his girlfriend at the time got, got pregnant. I think he was 17. She was 16. They moved out to the suburbs and he started putting siding on the wall and he just worked his way up. He was one of our subcontractors for quite a while and is now one of our, our main project managers. That's awesome. That's awesome. So as we're wrapping up here, um, and, and I really appreciate your time here, Ben, um, we started off by talking about the issues that come up in a business when you get disconnected from the field. What, what's the, so if I, if I know, if I'm getting a sense in my business that, you know, I'm, I'm disconnected and I may not exactly put my bags on like you do, which I think is pretty awesome. Actually, it's, it's, sure. it's a pretty neat thing. I, I really do. I think, I think that's cool. Even a, a very large general contractor, you know, you could get out there and, and get your boots on and, and get muddy with the, with the guys. If I know I'm disconnected, what would you recommend as the first step I take to, to get that connection back with the field? I think to bring your, your installers in and ask them what makes their job hard. What's yeah. what makes your job hard. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a, it'll be a great exercise to figure out something that you thought you knew you, you really didn't, right. you know, um, probably should have, but 
you know, it's, it's, it's hard. It's hard. It's, you know, you can't be involved in the day to day, you know, nitty gritty and, and, and you shouldn't, but you know, that information won't naturally escalate its way up, uh, up to you. Yeah, that's very good. Yeah. So you have to be proactive in, in going out there and getting information then. Yep. Yeah. Cause I mean, sometimes the project managers or production people, they'll, you know, they, they'll just take care of it because, you know, they don't want it to be on, on your radar when it's actually information that you need to, you know, you need to, uh, need to have. Yeah, it's interesting. So you 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 get your your project managers maybe and your your installers conspiring together, unintent not conspiring in a bad way, but to keep stuff from you. Sure. But you need to get the bad news, so to speak, so that you can do something about it from the position of 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 the final decision maker. Right, right. If 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 you think everything's puppies and bunnies all the time, then you need to get out of the office because there's stuff happening, you know, in your organization that you know isn't uh, uh, isn't all gravy. So so. As we're summarizing here, then, so getting connected, what what are what are a couple of other things I can do to to get reconnected with the field? I think create social so, uh, social uh, activities or environments yeah. where diff- people at different levels can interact, and you know, intentionally put people together who are at different levels in your your in your organization in a social setting where they can you know just just talk. Excellent. So. Go out there, ask them what makes their job hard, and then create those social environments, those social activities where the different aspects of your business can be working together or interacting with each other and building those relationships. Yep. What about in terms of, of the, the customer service part? How much time do you spend with your customers? So I still do a little bit of sales, which I think is vital to keeping a pulse on, you know, how are you going to market to someone right. that you don't know the questions they're asking in the house uh, or where they're finding, you know, the business owner as a sales guy is going to ask totally different questions than, you know, a sales guy. And so, you know, as far as marketing, like, you know, how'd you come across us? How, you know, what, what's your research looked like so far? What, you know, what have, what have you been, been looking at that also, you know, we have our salesmen go on a final walk around once everything's all complete and all the punch lists are done to ask for the the referrals and so on that at that instance i have the the uh the opportunity to ask about the process how'd it go you know and ask the hard questions like you know i want to know what you didn't like about our process like what were the pinch points what was the what was the pain you know that 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 was involved with this and that can be very very revealing and uh, you know to be able to pick at that a little bit and say all right well you know what would you feel that would, would be better at that point that you were frustrated? You know, how could we avoided that, uh, have avoided that or how could we have handled that differently so that, you know, that wasn't uh, an experience for you. That's neat. So the three things I get there is number one, you go to the field and ask them what makes your job hard and, and get that, that information that you need. You create those social activities um, so that you're, building those bridges between the field and the office. And then you get out in front of your customers and you have good, hard, honest conversations with them and even getting into the the selling mode once in a while so that you can get a feel for how things are going. Yep. Excellent. Well, Ben, I really appreciate your time. Give us a little bit more information about your company, how people can get in touch with you if they'd like to. So our uh, the best source is our website. It's craftsmanschoice.com. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, you know, we really... Uh, our focus is on uh, the exterior, exterior siding, windows and doors, and um, specialize in the James Hardy siding. That's something that uh, we really take pride in is, is our ability to be a leader uh, with that product. So our website would be that uh, the best source to check us out a little more. Excellent. Excellent. And you're up there in Minneapolis. Is that right? Yep. Okay. Yep. So, so I'm, I'm visiting Minneapolis. What's the one restaurant I've got to hit? If I'm up there for a client meeting or something like that, boy, I'm trying to think of something that's not a chain. You know, Granite City is a pretty, uh-huh. pretty good, pretty good restaurant. It's uh, they they brew their own, brew their own beer, and and they've got some uh, some killer apps. Excellent, excellent. Well, we'll put a link in the city in the in the show notes to Granite City as well as to your uh, your um, website and your LinkedIn profile. Ben, I really appreciate the insights that you shared with us today. It's been super interesting. And thanks for joining us on Construction Genius. 
Thanks, Eric. You get disconnected from the field sometimes in your construction business, and you know that's happening when profit starts to fade, customer issues come up, perhaps there's conflicts between the field and the office that are unresolved. And one of your key jobs as a construction company owner is to stay connected as much as you can. Now, obviously, you're not going to walk every single job site that you're on if you're running a multi-million dollar construction company. But there is times to get out into the field. There are times to sit face to face with your customers. And that is what we talk about today in this episode of Construction Genius. My guest is Ben Yunker. He is the co-founder and CEO of Craftsman's Choice, which is a leading exterior remodeling contractor in Minnesota. We talk about the symptoms of disconnection, how you get into the habit of staying in connection with the field, and specific action items that you need to take on a regular basis in order to bridge the gap between the office and the field and between the field and your clients, how to overcome issues in the field that seem insurmountable when you're on a project, and why it's so important as a construction company owner once in a while to get your bags on and go out and work with your guys. Now, I know some of you, that'll never happen because you're working as commercial contractors and you're you're not gonna put your bags on, but the point is getting into the field Getting belly to belly with the guys and the gals who are actually doing the work can be tremendously helpful in terms of giving you the right perspectives on where your business is. And those are the kinds of things that we dive into detail about during this conversation. So like I always say, enjoy my conversation with Ben. Feel free to share it with other people who you think may benefit from it. And thank you for listening to Construction Genius. Construction Genius. 